All right. So I've been thinking, I was talking to Terry this morning. Uh, these headphone, these uh, headsets, I've never worn one for a presentation before. I feel like, I'm not sure, am I like an R&B singer, like Neo? I think you probably don't want that. Uh, am I a magician? Uh, no, but I actually will have an assistant come up later to, to help. Uh, no, no, I'm an inspirational speaker like Tony Robbins. Uh, so my goal with this presentation today is to show you that you have the power and to show you the secrets of wetlands and Clean Water Act Section 404 and water quality standards for wetlands because uh, they're a really powerful tool to protect what I think are really important aquatic resources. So um, here's the disclaimer. And uh, I'm going to start off by giving an overview of uh, what wetlands are and uh, why I think they're important and why I think you should care about them too. Uh, then I'll go into the Section 404 program uh, and how it applies both to wetlands and aqu other aquatic resources, uh, its requirements and how it's implemented across the nation. Uh, and then at the end, we will uh, work together to actually write some water quality standards for wetlands. All right. All right, so uh, these slides were put together by um, my friend and former colleague, Donna Downing. Uh, so big ups to her. And you guys should really thank her because she's telling you all the takeaways right now. Uh, you could probably just go to lunch and uh, know everything. <laughs> but anyways, three main things that you need to know about Clean Water Act Section 404 and wetlands. So first, the 404 permit program affects all waters of the US not just wetlands. So if you're going to discharge dredger fill material into a water of the US, like a stream to put in a culvert or to stabilize a bank, you need a 404 permit. It's not just for wetlands. The flip side is true too. So jurisdictional wetlands are protected by all Clean Water Act programs, not just Section 404. So if you're going to discharge pollutants uh, through a point source into um, a wetland, you need a 402 permit. Uh, and then the last one is that uh, water quality standards for wetlands are probably going to look a lot different from water quality standards for your other waters. All right, so actually let's go back. So what, what's a wetland? Does anybody, does anybody want to tell me what a wetland is without looking at the next slide? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> yeah, there, there's different definitions for it. So uh, in the regulatory program, we use a three-parameter definition for wetlands. Uh, so the three things that are required are water, soils, and vegetation. So there needs to be water uh, at the surface or in the rooting zone uh, for at least two weeks during the growing season for an, aquatic, for an area to be considered a wetland. In addition to that, there needs to be soil conditions that are reflective of inundation or saturation. Uh, and we call these hydric soils. So there are different indicators of hydric soils out there. Um, one of the most obvious ones, you might notice uh, or two people around Lake Merritt. So kind of a smell, a sulfury smell that's indicating that redox functions are happening. You can also see uh, redox features in a soil, like little nodules around roots, uh, where you're seeing oxidation, uh, or accumulations of organic matter. All these, these things indicate um, anoxic conditions that are created by wetness, basically. Uh, and then the last thing, um, I think one of the more important things, is you need to have vegetation that's adapted to living in wet conditions. Uh, and we call these hydrophytes. Um, and these are basically just plants that like their feet wet. Um, so we have different classifications for, for plants. They get range from uh, obligate upland species to obligate wetland species. Uh, in the middle, you might have things that, are, uh, that like it wet but can tolerate some dryness. We'd call them fac wet, facultative wet, wetland species, uh, or species that kind of fall right in the middle. Uh, and that can make jurisdictional determinations really hard. And we just call them fac or facultative species. Uh, one uh, kind of problematic species for that in uh, the Central Valley and the, the foothills is Himalayan blackberry. So that's all over the stream channels uh, and it's fac. So you can't get to a jurisdictional wetland alone 
on Himalayan blackberry, you need to have some other wetland spe species present. All right, so uh, here is a list of different wetland types from EPA's wetlands website. Uh, and like I said, these slides were put together by Donna, um, and I don't necessarily agree with how they categorize some of the wetland types. Uh, but basically, you can think of wetlands as having um, four main categories. Uh, so marshes, uh, in general, are going to be herbaceous wetlands, wetlands where the, the uh, plants are, are soft and not woody. Um, so strictly speaking, marshes are inundated um, year-round. Uh, so only the, the first two uh, things that you see listed under marshes would be considered real marshes, uh, tidal marshes and freshwater marshes. Uh, the other ones I would consider to be more seasonal wetlands or um, depressional wetlands in some cases. Uh, wet meadows and prairies, we have a lot up in the uh, Sierras here. Um, they're very important for uh, um, retaining and slowly releasing groundwater uh, into streams. Uh, prairie potholes are not really in California uh, or in the West, but they're also another type of kind of isolated wetland. I talked a little bit about them uh, during the WOTUS presentation. Uh, playas are a big one in California, uh, and it's also one of the reasons behind how California chose to write their wetlands definition that uh, Ana Maria will be presenting on this afternoon. Uh, so playas tend to not have very much vegetation. Uh, so the way that they wrote their wetlands definition uh, made it possible for something to be a wetland uh, if it had no vegetation, as long as those other two factors were, were present, uh, hydrology and soils. Uh, and then uh, vernal pools are a wetland resource that's really near and dear, close to my heart. Um, California has lost over 95% of it's uh, vernal pools in the Central Valley, uh, mostly due to agricultural development, but also due to kind of suburban sprawl a little bit too. Um, all right, so outside of these herbaceous wetlands, marshes, and seasonal wetlands, uh, you have swamps, and swamps are characterized by woody vegetation. Uh, so uh, you can have uh, forested swamps um, in the in the southeast, they call these like bottomland hardwoods. Uh, we have some forested swamps in California. Uh, they tend to be associated with uh, the real big rivers and their valleys and floodplains. Uh, the Kasumnas uh, uh, River Preserve, just south of here, uh, has some forested wetlands. Uh, and then there are also shrub swamps, uh, which are like forested swamps, but they, instead of having trees, they have more shrubby vegetation. An important type of shrub swamp would be mangroves. Uh, and then the last two are kind of unique uh, resources. They're bogs and fens. Does anybody know what the difference between a bog and a fen is? All right, so they're, they're both kind of depressional features that are characterized by a lot of peat. Um, the main difference between a bog and a fen is that a bog is a completely closed basin. So the only water that it gets comes from its uh, contributing watershed and water doesn't leave except through transpiration or evaporation or infiltration in groundwater. Uh, in a fen, uh, they can be associated with river or lake systems. So those are the basic differences, but both are characterized by a lot of peat. Uh, and some have uh, carnivorous plants too, which is cool. All right, so here's a picture of some uh, forested wetlands, a forested swamp. I think this is a bottomland hardwood from the southeast. Uh, and then some tidal marshes. Tidal marshes are getting to be a pretty big deal for climate change adaptation in California and sea level rise mitigation. So tidal marshes uh, can capture uh, sediment and accumulate organic matter, so they actually rise over time. So tidal marshes can actually keep pace with sea level rise, whereas our, our traditional seawalls and levees are static, they don't move. Uh, vernal pools, I talked about before, home to just an incredible range of endemic flora in California and endangered and threatened species. Um, there are vernal pools across the United States. They actually have them in the east too. They tend to be um, more associated with forests, uh, but basically they're characterized by having this restrictive layer under the soil surface that prevents infiltration. So they just hold water for just long enough to develop these really unique plant communities. And like I said, there are vernal pools uh, across the US, but California is the only place where they've developed these really unique endemic plant communities. So I think they're really unique here. And again, prairie potholes. All right, so why are wetlands important? Um, 
the first one is probably the first thing that comes to mind. They provide habitat for fish and wildlife. So uh, do we have any birders here? Anybody do bird watching? Yeah. So some of the best places for birding tend to be wetlands and riparian areas, right? And that's where migratory birds tend to go. They look for the wet places. Uh, their wetlands also provide uh, important fish habitat and shellfish habitat. So if you like uh, shrimp uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, you can be guaranteed that those shrimp began their life in a tidal marsh. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, Wetlands can be really important for erosion control because they can capture sediment and then aggrade over time. Um, they'll also, uh, in doing so, they'll protect from coastal flooding during storm surges. Uh, Louisiana's loss of its coastal wetlands has made it a lot more susceptible to storm surge, and it's something that uh, they've taken uh, as, a, as one of their primary means of uh, adapting to climate change is restoring tidal wetlands. Uh, and that's also happening in the San Francisco Bay too. Uh, wetlands are also really important from, uh, for protecting from floods from, uh, from rivers flooding. So uh, Sacramento, you might have heard, is one of the most flood-prone areas in the U.S. It flooded really bad twice within like five years of California becoming a state. Uh, what uh, Governor John Stanford had to, uh, to paddle a canoe to get to his inauguration ceremony at the Capitol. Uh, and, but, so Sacramento doesn't flood anymore, right? You know, you didn't have to paddle a canoe to get here anymore. Why is that? It's because of wetlands, right? So, so for a long time, the Corps of Engineers thought that we could prevent flooding in California just by building levees higher and higher. But the fact is the water needs to go somewhere. And we figured out the best way to, the best place to put it is in its historic floodplain. So instead of taking down the levees and restoring a natural floodplain, we created a bypass system running along that historic floodplain uh, that now captures floodwaters and keeps Sacramento from flooding, as well as much of the Sacramento Valley. A great book on this is called Battling the Inland Sea um, by, I can't remember his name, Kelly, I think is the last name. Uh, but yeah, uh, I can find the reference for, you, for that if you guys are interested. Uh, wetlands are also really important for protecting and maintaining water quality. So wetlands are, are crucial. Uh, they're kind of a giant bioincubators for processing organic matter and nutrients. Um, yeah, it's, it's wild. Uh, and they also uh, sequester a lot of organic carbon too, so they can be important for climate change mitigation as well as adaptation. Uh, Wetlands improve water quality, so they're also crucial to drink, protecting drinking water. Uh, and uh, you know, like I alluded to before with uh, birding, they're great for recreational and educational opportunities. Uh, Cosumnes River Preserve just south of here is a great place to uh, bring your kids or school groups to learn about the different um, animals and plants that are in wetlands. Uh, there's a great uh, vernal pool that's used by an organization called Sacramento Sp Splash. Uh, in the the, Mather, the old Mather Air Force Base, uh, just south of Rancho Cordova. Uh, so wetlands can be great educational opportunities. Uh, can anybody th think of any other things that wetlands are important for? No? All right. So, insect production. Insect production, yeah. No, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, no. So yeah, wetlands uh, tend to be thought of as places that you don't want to go too close to. And for that reason, wetlands, I think, are also very important as refuges for persecuted peoples, right? So you guys know what today is. Today is Juneteenth. It commemorates the, the end of slavery in the American South. For a long time, uh, escaped slaves would go to the, uh, the Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia to hide from, um, from uh, call them slave catchers or, um, yeah. Uh, human traffickers, basically. Also, the, the Marsh Arabs of uh, Iraq and Iran uh, used uh, the, the swamps uh, in, I think, southeast Iraq and Iran uh, to escape per persecution from uh, the Ottoman Turks and uh, Saddam Hussein, too. So, uh, wetlands have uh, immense cultural value, too. Uh, so, despite that. One more. 
Yes. Um, they're also really important for proving out ecosystem service valuation for cost-benefit analysis. The Corps of Engineers was able to restore a lot of wetlands and cypress groves after Katrina through that approach. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, despite all this, wetlands are not in a great place in the U.S. right now. So uh, around the time of initial European arrival, we had 220 million acres of wetlands in the lower uh, 40, 48. We've lost about half of them, uh, and it's not evenly spread. Uh, California has lost uh, over 95% of its wetlands to development and agricultural development. Uh, and, but um, luckily, we've started to see a decline in the rate of loss, the rate of annual loss over the last 30 years. And a lot of this, I think, is due to Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which actually regulates the destruction of wetlands. Uh, also, in 1989, uh, President H.W. Bush uh, established a no net loss goal uh, nationwide for wetlands. Um, and that was very focused on the time and a no net loss of area. Uh, and it led to kind of some uh, questionable uh, quantification of gains uh, with like uh, ponds on golf courses being counted as wetlands. Uh, but uh, but the, um, the main effect of this is it uh, got folks to start considering offsetting impacts to wetlands through compensatory mitigation. Uh, so uh, wetlands are being lost at, a, at a, a lower rate, and we're also starting to restore some wetlands too now. So we're getting to be in a better place. Um, like I talked about on Monday, not all wetlands are subject to the Clean Water Act, like isolated wetlands. I think that's all I got to say. <laughs> all right, so I'll move on to Section 404 now. Uh, so Section 404 of the Clean Water Act says that uh, you need a permit if you want to discharge dredge or fill material from a point source into waters of the United States. Uh, so it's very similar to what uh, Gary talked about for Section 402, except instead of pollutants, we're talking about dredged or fill material. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, legal history around the definition of what constitutes dredge or fill material. I don't really want to talk about court cases in this presentation, so we can talk more about that later. Uh, so the, uh, um, the regulations that EPA developed uh, for uh, the 404 program says that no uh, discharge can be permitted if there is a practicable alternative. And our definition of practicable is slightly different uh, from, I think, what uh, Manjali talked about this morning under anti-deg. Uh, but it essentially means the same thing. Um, uh, if there's a practical alternative that exists that is less damaging to the aquatic environment, uh, or if the, uh, the nation's waters would experience uh, significant degradation, which is also a, a term of art. Uh, so to apply for a 404 permit, uh, these are kind of the steps that you need to follow. Uh, first off, you need to determine what wetlands and other waters you actually have on your site. Uh, and determine whether those waters are waters of the United States. Um, and then the way that this is done is there's a, uh, you either conduct or uh, hire a consultant to conduct a wetland delineation, uh, submit that to the core, uh, either saying these wetland, we think these wetlands are jurisdictional, or we think some of these wetlands are jurisdictional and some aren't, or we think none of these wetlands are jurisdictional, and the core will respond to that. EPA also evaluates jurisdictional determinations. I talked a little bit about that on Monday, though. Uh, beyond that, uh, just because you have jurisdictional waters on site doesn't necessarily need to mean you need a permit for the action that you're going to do. It might not be something that meets the definition of a discharge of dredge or fill material, uh, or it might be exempt from permitting requirements, and I'll talk a little bit about exemptions later. Uh, if you are getting a 404 permit from the Corps of Engineers, and there are actually states that have assumed the 404 program, uh, but if you're getting a permit from the uh, from the Corps of Engineers, there also needs to be an associated 401 certification or a waiver associated with that permit. And I'll talk more about uh, what's required under, uh, under 401 later this afternoon. Uh, and then you send your permit application uh, to the Corps or to your authorized state. So there are two states that have assumed the 404 program. Uh, none of them are around here. It's uh, Michigan and New Jersey. There are a number of other states uh, like Arizona that are pursuing assumption of the 404 program. Um, so if you guys have questions about 404 assumption, I'm happy to talk about that, that later too. 
Um, so you, uh, the last step is then you send your permit application to the core or whoever the, the permitting agent, uh, entity is. Uh, so uh, the way, so I'll talk a little bit now about the way that we that the core processes these permits. Uh, so first off, they determine uh, you know if if it requires a permit, uh, if it's not exempt or uh, is doesn't meet the definition of a discharge of dredge, dredge or fill material, uh, and if it does require a permit, then they determine if it uh, falls under one of the existing general permits, which are issued on a five-year cycle. Uh, core permits can only be issued for five years. Uh, you can't, uh, they, can, they can be extended later on, but uh, five years is the maximum issuance. Uh, and then, uh, so the vast majority of uh, 404 regulated activities are authorized under general permits. Uh, and the vast majority of those are authorized under what are called the nationwide permits, uh, which are issued by the Corps on a five-year rolling cycle. The last set were issued in 2017. Um, anything that doesn't meet the requirements of a general permit would then require an individual permit, which requires, uh, uh, there are two types of individual permits. There are uh, standard permits, uh, which are just kind of the, the catch-all. And then uh, if there are uh, impacts that, um, don't meet the like level of significance as uh, as determined under NEPA. Usually, those can be processed uh, through what's called a letter of permission, uh, which just uh, the main difference is it doesn't require uh, public noticing. Uh, all standard permits require public noticing. Can I ask you a question about regional? Like, is regional? Yeah. Do you mean? I mean, we guess we think California centric. Like, do you mean regions in the federal government system regional, or is this regional meaning it could be statewide? I'm, I'm sorry, you're asking about regional general permits? Yeah, pro compared to nationwide, regional, and programmatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so individual core districts can issue uh, a regional general permits that cover um, you know, a certain set of similar activities. Uh, in California, we have a general, pretty much all districts have a general permit that covers emergency actions. So that's the ones that we see the most. Uh, the core has special permitting procedures for things that are deemed to be emergencies. Um, also have like regional general permits for things like uh, aquatic resource restoration. Um, it's another one in California. I'm sorry? In kind construction. In kind construction, yeah. Uh, yeah, maintenance activities also uh, often fall under general permits if they're not exempt. Um, so yeah, those are those are two types: the nationwide and the regional. Then there's another one called a programmatic general permit, uh, and that's actually meant for uh, areas where a state would have a, a well-established wetlands regulatory program, and the core thinks they don't need to duplicate efforts, so they kind of create a way to to streamline permitting using a programmatic general permit. Uh, that's something that's being considered by Sacramento District for the uh, habitat conservation plans in Placer County and South Sacramento County. I don't know if y'all have heard about that. Um, but anyways, so uh, if you have a, a uh, if you're issuing a new permit, whether it's a general permit or an individual permit, you need a public notice uh, and then solicit comments. Uh, the core then will review the application and any comments on the public notice uh, to um, to determine what the permitting requirements would be. Um, and EPA often comments on uh, proposed permits, um, and we have kind of a special authority under the Clean Water Act related to 404. The course of permitting agency, EPA, uh, wrote the 404B1 guidelines, the actual criteria that are used to evaluate permits. Uh, so we submit comments consistent with that. And then we also have a sort of oversight role uh, where we can potentially um, uh, flag per permits as uh, for, for being elevated to headquarters for review, sort of through dispute resolution procedures. Uh, something that we we use a little bit but not too frequently uh, and we can actually we have the authority under 404 c to veto uh, 404 permits and uh, actually um, designate areas as no uh, as areas that cannot uh, have discharges of dredge or fill material to waters of the us in them uh, and that that's something that's used very sparingly so we, we've never had a 404 c uh, action finalized in region 9 
uh, and nationally, um, they typically happen maybe every five years, give or take, and so very, very infrequently. Uh, if you've heard about the Bristol Bay case in Alaska, that is an example of a 404C action. Yes? Um, does EPA review all the 404 permits? I, uh, we... And provide comments? That's a complicated question. So, um, in region, it, it depends. So, uh, the regions are not equally distributed in the amount of permit actions that we review. In areas with a lot of wetlands and a lot of development, like in the southeast for EPA Region 4, which covers the southeastern US, they get a ton of public notices that they have to review every day. They can't look at all of them, so they screen a lot of them. In Region 9, we don't get that many. Uh, there's a lot of development in California and the Southwest, but not a lot of wetlands. Um, and the impacts to wetlands tend to fall under these general permits, uh, which we have less, less oversight of. So we comment on the general permits when they're proposed, uh, not as much on the pre-construction notifications that the Corps sends to us. Uh, typically speaking, for a standard permit, we try to review all of them, any one that we get. All right. So, uh, so then the core can uh, decide to issue the permit. Uh, they can the the permit applicant can withdraw an application, or the core will often administratively withdraw an application if they haven't gotten information that they requested from the applicant uh, after a certain period of time. Um, or the core can actually deny a permit, and that happens really, really rarely. It's like one or two percent of permit applications get to get formally denied by the core. All right, so one of the, the uh, most important aspects of uh, environmental review of 404 permits is the 404 B1 guidelines, which like I said, were uh, developed by EPA. And this is actually, this was written into section 404 of the Clean Water Act, is this is a permitting program that will be uh, administered by the core but EPA writes the criteria. Uh, so EPA promulgated these criteria in the 1980s, uh, I think it was in uh, 86, uh, and they haven't changed since then, essentially. Uh, so there are four main criteria uh, under the 404 B1 guidelines. So uh, the first one, uh, I think most the people is the one that people are most familiar with. Uh, it's the LEDPA requirement. So it requires that no permit can be issued for an impact to aquatic resources unless that, uh, that action, that alternative, is deemed to be the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. That's kind of a mouthful, but uh, the least environmentally damaging part is easy enough to understand. So the alternative that would have the least impacts to aquatic resources uh, either an area or function uh, could be considered to be the least environmentally damaging, as long as it doesn't have any other significant environmental impacts. Um, practicable is where we tend to get wound around the axle with, uh, with applicants. So practicable means uh, an alternative is practicable if it's capable of being done after taking into account cost, existing technology, and logistics in light of overall project purposes. So those, those three elements there, cost, existing technology, and logistics, those are the main ones that we wind up talking about the most. Anybody have questions about practicable or uh, LEDPA? Yes? You mentioned that um, you look at area and function and other environmental impacts. Do you have specific regs about how you go about that, or is that done through the NEPA process, or? Yeah, uh, so it, it varies by core district. Um, most core districts now are less obsessed with area uh, as being the primary indicator of function. Um, for a long time, especially with this no net loss policy, uh, we were very focused on making sure that after a permit was issued, there would be just as many wetlands in terms of area as there were before. Uh, now we're starting to understand, you know, a lot of the time when, when areas are proposed for impact, they tend to be pretty degraded because they're adjacent to existing development. They're, you know, good for development already. 
Uh, so you try to account for that in terms of function. So, um, uh, and this kind of gets a little bit into compensatory mitigation too. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have like a, a real clear answer on that. But yeah, those are kind of the two main things that the core will look at is functions and area. Uh, so the second one actually isn't on this slide, um, and it says that the core can't issue a permit for a uh, can't issue a 404 permit uh, if it would conflict with other environmental regulations. And the the four that are specifically listed are uh, state water quality standards, uh, effluent limitations, the environment, the Endangered Species Act, uh, and the Marine Protection Sanctuaries and Research Act. I always get those mixed up. MPRSA. Um, so, uh, you know, there's already this requirement under Section 401 that a state certify that um, a federal permit won't impact or won't uh, violate state water quality standards. Uh, so it's kind of duplicative to also have it in the 404B1 guidelines, but it's just kind of adds that extra layer of protection. Um, the third one uh, says that the core cannot issue a permit for an impact to aquatic resources uh, if it would cause or contribute to significant degradation of waters of the United States. Uh, and this is uh, one that's um, not really well defined. Uh, there are a bunch of examples given for how uh, something could be evaluated as to whether it would cause or contribute to significant degradation. Uh, but we think about um, you know, not only the impacts of the fill itself, but any uh, secondary impacts uh, that would be caused by you know, changes to, to the flow of water, uh, changes to uh, shading or uh, exposure to noise. Um, or uh, cumulative impacts, so the, the fact that um, a bunch of little impacts can add up to have a big effect over time. Uh, and then the last criteria uh, is, um, is, was really originally written to be about minimizing impacts, and that's typically interpreted to include like uh, best management practices and construction, uh, making sure that you're not generating a lot of, uh, a lot of suspended solids that'll wash into receiving waters. Uh, but uh, since then, it's actually been added to include uh, compensatory mitigation, which is a, a big and growing part of the wetlands program. Uh, and this, this is, I don't know how familiar you all are with uh, compensatory mitigation or wetlands offsets, but essentially, um, you know, right now, if you get a, a permit from the Corps of Engineers to impact X number of wetlands, uh, you can be required to restore or pay somebody to restore that number of wetlands or more. And that's kind of linked back to that national no net loss policy. All right. Yes? When you use that word degradation, now you're not using it in the sense of anti-degradation as defined by no longer meaning attainable existing uses. That's a different kind of degradation. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's defined separately. I think, um, some states do kind of roll that into their anti-deg policies in a way, but significant degradation as evaluated by the core, uh, doesn't take into account, uh, state anti-deg policies. Yeah. That would be something that would be considered in the 401 certification though. Certainly. Yes. So, you mentioned that you mentioned that one of the causes of um, one of the factors in significant degradation can be a change in flow. So, is this the the part of the four hundred four analysis that looks at sort of the larger impacts of the project as a whole, while the rest is focused on what's the impact of discharge? So, if you have a project that's both changing hydrology and will, for example, dewater wetlands, mm -hmm. but then will also fill other wetlands is... Yeah, actually, those will usually be considered in the alternatives analysis. So we, we say that, um, you know, when you talk about a LEDPA, you should be considering not only the direct impacts of the fill, but any secondary or cumulative effects too. Um, and I think you know maybe that starts to get at, towards the scope of analysis that the core uses in NEPA. And that's kind of complicated, but I'm happy to talk more after this presentation about that. 
All right, so uh, aside from the 404B1 guidelines and environmental criteria for evaluating an, an application, the Corps has its own public interest review uh, that it conducts as a part of 404. Uh, and they consider uh, a really wide range of things, impacts on economics, energy, aesthetics, um, flooding, traffic, uh, lots of different things. This isn't something that's required under Clean Water Act at all. It's just something that the Corps does programmatically through its regulatory program. Uh, and then, yeah, some other uh, considerations. I mentioned ESA before, but also uh, 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 Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act can often be a, a big sticking point uh, in permit applications. Uh, and then since a federal permit is a federal action, it requires NEPA. Oh, I want to add a point that I guess I've learned is that the Corps only uh, considers federally endangered species, does right. not accept any state listed species. So that can lead to some conflicts between California and the Army Corps. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it just considers the Federal Endangered Species Act, not California's Endangered, Endangered Species Act. All right. Um, this has a lot of text on it. I'm not going to go through everything. But uh, as I alluded to before, uh, some actions, even though they constitute a discharge of dredge, dredge or fill material from a point source into a water of the United States, uh, are exempt from permitting under the Clean Water Act. And these are called the 404F exemptions. Uh, and they're by and large related to um, agricultural activities. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of these, the, well, it's the first five bullets there are all related to, to activities typically associated with agriculture or silviculture uh, that can um, result in a discharge of dredger fill material to the to waters of the United States. Uh, another one that's in there is uh, maintenance of structures. So the, the core requires that any uh, fills that are permitted are maintained. Uh, so rather than making people go back and get a permit every time they want to maintain uh, their uh, pre-existing fill, uh, th that activity tends to be exempt. Now, this uh, slide doesn't talk about, well, oh yeah, it does, it mentions. So a lot of these activities can be recaptured uh, under 404F. So just because it's listed as it's an exempt activity, it can be recaptured uh, if it uh, represents a new use of um, the area, the wetland, uh, and conversion from wetlands to uplands is considered to be a new use. So if you destroy a wetland, it's recaptured. Uh, and if it would uh, result in a change in the uh, extent or reach um, or circulation of waters. I don't remember the exact words that go into it. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, that recapture provision is interpreted broadly. So a lot of activities that you think would be exempt under 404F do get recaptured. Yes? Uh, with that recapture analysis, is I know you said before that EPA will review the 404 permits. Will it review those determinations to, to determine if if the Corps finds that the activity is exempt under 404F, but can EPA review that and determine, no, the recapture provision applies? Uh, yes, it typically is not done on a case-by-case -case basis, but rather sort of programmatically. Uh, so if there's like a certain uh, class of activities that the Corps is calling ex exempt and not recaptured, uh, EPA could do what's called a policy elevation uh, to headquarters and um, for sort of dispute resolution around that. But uh, we typically do not uh, review every determination of a 404 exemption, 404 F exemption that comes from the core. All right. Uh, any other questions on 404? For a, yes. for a 404 F exemption, do you still need a 401 cert? No. Uh, so, um, 401 certifications, which I'll talk about after lunch, are only required for federal permits. So if an activity is exempt from permitting requirements, it doesn't require a federal permit, and hence does not require a 401 certification. But you could capture these with a WDR using Porter Cologne. Right, yeah, that doesn't say anything about state laws, so things could very well be regulated under Porter Cologne. And, and just to define recaptured for, could you do that? Yeah, so recapture basically just means that, uh, so uh, this, these activities, they escaped from 404, 
uh, and um, we are recapturing them when uh, we say that <laughs> that they are still regulated. Does that make sense? All right. Yes. Um, does the state what, does the state have standing to challenge a 404 exemption that the Corps makes, or who who's making those on a case by case basis? Um, so those those are typically made by core project managers. So the core project managers are um, just kind of staff level people that issue permits. Uh, so that they'll also make 404 F exemptions. Um, you know, for for more complicated or controversial cases, those might be uh, decided at a higher level. Um, as far as whether a state has uh, standing, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really say. Uh, there, there might be some case law around it. I'm, I will admit that I, I'm not as familiar with uh, 404F uh, just because it's not something that EPA gets as closely involved with as other aspects of 404. Um, but I, I'm happy to put you in contact with folks that know more. Yes? Um, just to clarify, it's the um, core that determines that these activities are exempt or an area, is uh, that right? EPA can also determine that too. How would EPA know and get involved? Or uh, if the core requests that they do. Okay. okay, and then you said, for example, as an example, if you destroy a wetland or turn into upland, is that all of the wetland area or part of it can be? Um, you know, qual can qualify to for recapture? Uh, yeah, so um, that would be a, a change in, uh, it'd be a change in use and it would be re result in a reduction in reach of the wetland, so it would be recaptured. Janet, did you have anything? Well, no, I was just wondering if you had an example of something recaptured. I'm still not sure I'm understanding okay. the concept. Yeah. Yeah, so um, without naming any names, uh, there, let's say there's a, um, a case in the Central Valley where a farmer uh, goes through and uh, deep rips a lot of uh, vernal pools on his land to plant orchards. Um, so those that that activity uh, could be considered exempt under 404F um, as uh, kind of an established farming activity, uh, potentially. You know, they could argue that at least. However, by uh, by destroying that wetland and changing the use um, essentially from a wetland to a farm field, it would be recaptured. Yeah. All right. I, th I think that's all I have on 404. So if anybody has any other questions? All right. So uh, now we're going to go into wetland water quality standards. Uh, so um, the Clean Water Act requires states to adopt water quality standards for waters. And no distinctions are made between wetlands and other waters. So we should have water quality standards for wetlands, right? Yeah. Uh, so water quality standards are also important to uh, make sure that uh, all of the provisions of the Clean Water Act, not just 404, that are applied to other surface waters are also being applied to wetlands too, because just, just like in bullet two there, all of the Clean Water Act applies to jurisdictional wetlands. Uh, there are a lot of benefits associated with developing water quality standards for wetlands. Um, I think the most primary of which uh, it provides a basis for you to make your 401 certification decisions based on. Um, standards provide that clear, that clear basis for making those permitting decisions under 402 and 404, but also under 401, uh, whereas the core is supposed to consider water quality standards, uh, but the state has the final call. Um, yeah, that also talks about water quality certification. Uh, standards uh, can also help improve monitoring programs uh, because they uh, can provide a benchmark against which to, to measure the condition and functions of wetlands uh, against reference conditions or ambient conditions or wetlands in another region. Uh, and, they, and water quality standards can also provide a basis for voluntary restoration and protection of wetlands. Uh, to kind of serve as a guide uh, for what to expect 
in, in terms of final aquatic resource condition. Uh, so here are some of the, the key differences uh, in what we expect water quality standards to look like for wetlands and other waters. Uh, the first one is just the type and particularly the reversibility of impacts that you see. So um, we're not going to see permits to fill in the Sacramento River, right? But you might see a lot of the majority of permits that you might see related to wetlands are not going to be for discharges of pollutants, but for the outright destruction of wetlands. Uh, so the water quality standards that you develop for wetlands might want to be more focused on maintaining uh, aquatic resource functions and areas rather than specific wetlands themselves. Um, and uh, so that, that way, in, in that case, it might make more sense to focus on uh, developing water quality standards for classes of wetlands rather than individual wetlands. That being said, um, you know, if you have uh, large, uh, significant uh, wetlands like, you know, maybe the Susun Marsh or uh, parts of the Delta that you want to protect, uh, it makes sense to develop water quality standards for those specific wetlands. Um, there's kind of a difference in just kind of like the role that wetlands play in the landscape relative to other waters. Uh, so wetlands um, have their own uses and functions and values, uh, and they also protect other waters, maybe the waters that your uh, standards program is most focused on from pollution. Uh, so you need to both account for the intrinsic values of wetlands uh, and the, the benefit that they provide to other aquatic resource types. Um, Another one that I kind of talked about before is just in the, the number and uh, quantity of wetlands out there. So that the numbers of wetlands are way higher uh, than the numbers of traditionally navigable waters uh, or uh, waters that you might be focused on. Uh, so maybe it makes more sense to develop water quality standards that are based on classes or uh, regional classes of wetlands rather than uh, individual wetlands. Uh, and then wetlands uh, are really sensitive, particularly in the arid southwest, uh, to inter and annual variability and precipitation. Uh, so uh, vernal pools in particular uh, can go f uh, one year from looking at like just a crappy degraded seasonal wetland to the next year having um, tons of endangered and threatened species. Uh, and vernal pool endemic species. So you kind of have to account for that interannual va variability when you're doing that too. I think that also applies for other aquatic resources um, and standards in the West. All right, a uh, couple other ways. Uh, so yeah, I might want to develop uses and uh, narrative criteria that uh, reflect the actual functions of wetlands. Um, maybe you want to do numeric criteria. It, tends to take longer to develop those. Uh, but uh, they're probably going to, the, the numbers are probably going to look a lot different, especially for things like DO and pH than you'd expect in a nice, well-mixed water bodies. Uh, and then, let's see. And yeah, and then uh, this is talking about where you can uh, use your anti-deg policy to kind of roll in other aspects of the, the 404B1 guidelines. Um, which is something that I think the state board is done with uh, their dredge and fill procedures. All right. So here, uh, here's a list of states with uh, uh, wetland water quality standards. The table is a little outdated, but the figure is from a 2015 report, so pretty up to date. Um, not a lot of states out there with uh, spe wetland specific water quality standards, but most states apply water quality standards to wetlands right now except for a very few. Um, and now we're going to move to the web, and we're actually going to write our own water quality standards that you'll use for the exercise this afternoon. Uh, so um, OK, so first, we'll, so this is uh, a website that there's a link to in the, the course materials on the last slide of this presentation. Um, it's, it's like Mad Libs. So we're going to, uh, we're going to, Use, uh, use our Mad Libs to write some water quality standards. That's how it usually works, right? <laughs> right. Cool. All right. So let's uh, start with de designated uses. So can we go to that template? Where is that? Uh, it's the upper right. Yep. Cool. All right. And um, 
So uh, you start off by picking which wetlands, and I'm actually going to pick them for you because it's important for the exercise this afternoon. We're going to do riverine wetlands. So for riverine wetlands, as defined by the, let's go the state-defined classification scheme, uh, we call it CRAM, uh, the uses to be protected include but not are but are not limited to, um, so what are some uh, aquatic resource functions of wetlands? Maybe we should start with the, uh, the 101A2 uses, because we have to do those, unless you want to do in UAA, right? So let's uh, click the ones with the cross next to them. Uh, indigenous flora and faunal diversity. Um, right. Yeah, and recreation. Yeah. All right, so what are some other things that riverine wetlands are important for? Flood flow attenuation. Flood flow attenuation, for sure. Uh, what about base flow discharge? Yeah, let's do that one too. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, we'll just use those for now. Uh, so uh, the uses to be protected include, but not are, are not limited to these. Uh, to the extent that such uses, functions, values, yeah, let's go. Let's go with uses and functions. That kind of links the two programs together, uh, as a, as represented by. Um, I don't know. What do we want to use? Yeah. Let's uh, let's actually use a reference network. So um, great way to. Uh, do, to um, develop wetland water quality standards is based on a reference network. So let's do uh, reference wetlands as opposed to reference standard wetlands. Okay. Yeah, so if you click that, that'll clean it all up and uh, put all of our words into that. And can we like copy and paste that into a Word document or something? Cool. All right, base flow, that's not a word. Uh, all right, yeah, let's go back to the website now. So those are our uses uh, for riverine wetlands. Uh, so let's do the criteria next. All right, so we're doing uh, riverine wetlands, as defined by the state-defined classification st scheme, shall maintain all, let's do them all, yeah. As determined by, we used reference wetlands, uh, including but not limited to, so these are a little different. Um, so yeah, I think base flow is a good one. Yeah, I think that's a good one too. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, let's do that. Um, are you guys familiar with floristic quality, that concept? Yeah, it's kind of complicated. We can talk about that later. Let's not do that. Uh, yeah, so uh, riparian corridor is really important uh, for, um, for migrating animals. So let's do normal movement of fauna. Yeah, I think that's a good one, too. Yeah, let's do that, too. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that too. All right, that's enough. Let's go with that. This one has a lot of semicolons in it. <laughs> we can clean that up a little bit before the activity. All right, and then we just need to do the anti-dig policy. All right, so using the state-defined classification scheme, Yep, yeah, and for your tier two. And uh, we said we, we want to protect uh, uses. And uh, let's go with functions for sure. And you want to do area two? Yeah, let's do area two. All right. Want to do ecological, ecological integrity? Yeah, let's do it all. <laughs> yeah, why not? All right, and we're just doing this for riverine wetlands. 
And it's, we're talking about a state, the state of the art. Uh, and then we just need to do the tier three and we're gonna do all of those, right? Functions, what values area, ecological integrity. All right, wasn't that easy? So everybody's gonna go home and use this template to write some wetland water quality standards, right? Yeah, I, I understand that uh, developing any sort of water quality standards, including uh, narrative standards is uh, not an easy process at all. Um, all right, so um, this was all we needed to do for this presentation. I think uh, we can break for lunch now. If anybody has questions, feel free to come ask me. Thanks for your time.